Um, hello, my name is James Miles. I'm one of the directors from Archivision. Um, Archivision, it's a generic kind of thing, but we have a company in Estonia, a company in the UK, and a research and development company uh, based in Estonia. We, um, we all come from different backgrounds. M many of us are archaeologists, um, but a few of us are computer scientists. And really it's the merging of these, te of these, these uh, qualities that we have and we've kind of gone through and we're trying to change um, cultural heritage in terms of recording. Good, I'm speaking to this. It's a little bit... There we go. No, I'll, I'll talk into this one. Um, so the lady of uh, Kazan Church, in 2015, we did a documentation. Uh, this is one of the, it's the 70, it's 1721, it's the oldest extant wooden um, sacral building in Tallinn. Tallinn is in Estonia. Uh, it's a lovely city, very medieval um, in, in, in respect to that. And as we go to the next slide, these, this is the, the building that we have. It's quite small compared to some of the churches that do exist. Um, but it's also very complex and the purpose of what we wanted to do was to create a, a record for the Russian Orthodox Church um, because they wanted to redevelop some of the building work and they wanted to kind of go through and understand more about what it was that was there. Uh, within this we um, had to do, we had to consider a few things, so we had to, we were doing laser scanning, photogrammetry and a number of other techniques but within this we wanted to understand the scanning locations camera calibration, weather conditions, light conditions, all these play a massive effect in terms of how we record. And to understand this is, is very, very important. We were using on site a, a P, I think it's a P20 we were using, but we were, as you can see, we were recording it in winter when it was snowing, which is very, very hard to do. Um, but the, the Leica system that we have there was very um, robust and we were able to do it in quite cold temperatures. This obviously does affect the scanning quality sometimes, but with the new assistant that I could bring in out, it allows more control. Um, we we're actually able to use this via a smartphone as well, which is the fantastic um, process of what Leica are developing, the ability to kind of stand away from it, get out of the scan data, um, and then you can also change and manipulate the height. So as you can see there, we were using the smartphone, and we had to come up with different ways of capturing it. So the problem with, with where this is, it's in a very industrial, it's in a very uh, urban area and trying to access different heights, we had to uh, go into all these different buildings, some of them very, very tall. And yeah, as you can see, there's Hemmer up there standing on top of this building. So health and safety is obviously a massive concern with us when we were doing the recording. Um, but in terms of actual local uh, conditions, the, the kind of the gilding reflects and absorbance and vibration within the church would have affected the scan data. Um, and we basically use a cloud to cloud comparison, but we're also tying in with targets. So we place these targets around the building. Um, quite cramped conditions, so we're going to have to be, we were trying to tie in the, um, the equipment so it wasn't going to be moving. And as you can see on here, it's a very nice uh, in internal viewing, but we were able to extend the pole slightly as well, so we were able to manipulate it. And that pole was really helpful in terms of capturing the height variance uh, to create a point cloud that was more even in terms of point spacing, and then it allowed for the exterior section to be more constant as well. And as I said, that's the snow conditions that we were working with, so having to stop it, wipe the, wipe the mirror system on the scanner, so there was no, no errors associated with it. And then these were some of the results that we had. So we managed to record the entire building and the, the exterior section. So we have all the perimeters. As we go through, the, the point data we have was, was very, very high. Um, the representation that we managed to do at the end of it was about a millimeter spacing. Um, that's only to do with data size. Uh, we had much larger point density, um, but with the manipulation and the, and, and the kind of the data size, it was more important to reduce it down slightly. And then what we were able to do with it was to kind of do slices through the whole section and from that we were able to do a number of CAD drawings. And this kind of related to more about what I'm talking about later on in terms of BIM production. Um, as we go through you can kind of see the quality going of, of this. Um, and then we have a short animation if it's going to work. There we go. I love technology. Um, so you can kind of see here, we recorded it in black and white, we weren't too worried about the colour variance because we were doing other things later on. Um, as we kind of go through, the point density is quite, is quite good. I'll just let that kind of go through. But having this record is something that was quite unique because nothing existed 
um, previously to this. So the only other data we had was people building surveys, which offered very little in terms of the details that was, that's being shown through here. And with the ability of scanning, we were able to get into all these individual sections that we weren't able to with the total station. And as you'll see in a second, as we go through into the timber, it actually offers a quite a good interpretation of what's there. And this wouldn't be possible using any other technique, especially in these tight areas. With photogrammetry, uh, we actually use something different. So normally with your, with your photogrammetry, you're using a handheld DSLR. Um, that's all well, very good but there's no consistency in terms of what you're recording. So we used a panoramic head and we were going through, we were doing 300, well, 180 degree angles in a, in a vertical field. And in one session, we, we, I think we managed to capture something in the range of the 2,000 images of, of the entire interior. We went through as a cross, as kind of a cross section. And then these are some of the results that we have. So what you may be wondering why we did photogrammetry as well with, with the laser scanning, the simple reason is the textual detail. It's much better to be using a photogrammetry model for the textual detail than it is the laser scan, because the laser scanning um, camera, or the laser scanning camera is very poor, and normally problems in terms of um, ma ma mixing it up in terms of um, the line, uh, let me try again. There are always problems in terms of aligning the um, camera data with the point cloud, you, and that adds to the processing time, and that's one issue that is always um, pre um, prevalent in it. But within the photogrammetry, we were able to do orthophotos, so we were able to slice it down, and then we were able to then use this data directly within the kind of CAD drawings, uh, which adds something better in terms of what we were doing, because if you look at a simple CAD drawing, then it's fantastic, but there's no understanding in terms of what's there. So when, as soon as you add some form of textual detail, it's better. Along with that, we did panoramic photography as well. So we have a wide range of data that we had uh, for this church, something that was quite unique. And this is kind of a merge of what we were doing. So the ability to take all the CAD drawing from the scan data, slicing it down, doing, doing the, uh, the individual section drawings, tying it in with the textual detail from the photogrammetry and the panoramic uh, detail. And as we zoom in, uh, we're able to outline individual sections within the CAD drawing. So it's kind of a, it's a nicer process in terms of just going on site and doing well. I'm doing a survey, fantastic. There are always questions which you can ask later on in terms of the data that you have. There's all well and good capturing it, but you don't know what other people will be using the data for in the future. So you want to future proof it in terms of your recording. With that, we then have some really nice kind of detail coming through on on the plans, and, and it's like I said, it's all well and good. So we've done a, a, a standard plan section of each elevation and each floor level but the most important thing what we wanted to do within this was the BIM section so building information modeling it's been around for, for a little bit of time now but the problem with this is there's no set guidelines as to what should be done within BIM. BIM is a process that involves creating and using intelligent 3D models to inform and communicate project decisions within that you have the design visualization simulation and collaboration the BIM that we created for this model is based on the Estonian real estate company model design guidelines, which are great, but within that, within the wider sphere of everything, there are other sections which you can kind of go to. The purpose of BIM, there's a wide range of different things as to why you would want to include it, but one of the main things that we wanted to include within, within this one was the inventory, so for simulations, calculations, and control factor. Simulation is always good, but the calculations in terms of material used is fantastic and the control as, as to what can be done in the future. As we go through, so we've done a wider application within BIM um, and we're looking at how best that we can kind of produce something for future, for future work. Within the UK, just alone, there are different BIM guideline groups that do exist, but these offer nothing in terms of cultural heritage. Historic England um, are obviously the main people, but they've released a metric survey specification for cultural heritage. Uh, within that, it's an eight-page guideline on how to use BIM, and there's actually no guidelines in there. It gives a generic overview of what should be done, and it's not very helpful. But Historic England have just released, uh, have just signed uh, Rambo, a uh, engineering company, to develop guidelines for, for more BIM introduction within cultural heritage, and hopefully we can kind of get part of that. But these different people have different ideas about what should be done. And there's a whole kind of application within the CA in terms of what is real, what should be done, and different ideas bring different things. And this is the whole purpose of this. I'm trying to introduce this within the within CA is what could be done with it. 
So within BIM, it's a fantastic system, but we see it more as being used as a conservation tool. BIM offers a lot of data. There are visual CAD drawings which you include, which you're used to. You then have a database system which manages your metadata. Um, but this isn't currently used by anyone except for, built, uh, for, except for surveys, uh, surveyors. So using this within each section within archaeology and cultural heritage, such as conservation bodies like the Historic Building Conservation, Institute of Conservation, and then using that for professional um, conservators, trainees, and then academic departments will develop a system that's more generic and can be used by wider people. Within the whole system, there's a wide range of different things. So the introduction of BIM, there is different implementations as to what you can do. There are level zero, level one, level two, level three, and that's ever expanding. So in the future, say 10 years time, there may be different things that we will be including. But the way that it's moving forward is moving to a system that's kind of more integrated. With cloud technology now existing, there are different people all over the world that can access this, they can do different things, look at the data, and then see it. Within the UK, well, with new software implementations that are occurring, level two and level three, which is kind of associated with um, electronic information and then integrated electronic information, it's becoming more manageable, but again, there's no standard practice. So in the future, there's, there's a system that it's confusion really as to what level should be done within cultural heritage, and this is what the new Historic England tender should be assessing. Within, in the UK, it's the UK government are insisting on a standard BIM level 2 within any project over £50,000. But that level 2 is not necessarily going to include all the information that you may want to have. One thing in terms of cultural heritage is to look at 4D and 5D applications. So 4D, there's something called phasing which has a time variance. So if you're looking at, say, a wall and you want to see the differences going through, this can be included within your BIM model. Um, but the integration is very key, but there's, there's always problems with the software side of it. At the minute, uh, Revit modelling and A360, which is a cloud network, are the main two systems that are used. Autodesk, we were at something in December um, in, in Estonia, which looks at uh, four new pieces of software that Autodesk are bringing out uh, in terms of BIM, and it's going to be more a, of a base of helping us doing each section so we can do it on site, we can do it on the cloud network, and then we can do a comparison as to what you've built virtually, and then you can go back on site and then do a direct comparison to, between your virtual model and the real data, because there's always differences with what is, what, with, what, with what is produced. Um, but again, within this, there are different standards. Uh, different file formats. Um, at the minute, the guidelines that do exist, they want an ISO uh, file format, which is great. But then, if you can't, if you don't have Revit, which is again quite an expensive piece of software if you're a commercial unit, then you can't really use it at all. Academically, the software is, is free, um, but when you want to look into more conservation uh, practices, it's very hard to then introduce. Um, so the future of BIM, or what, what it should be, it should be based more on alert and constrained flags. So imagine um, you're at a building, uh, it's a 12th century building, uh, obviously you're not allowed to do anything in terms of putting electrical cabling through the wall. For someone who's not a cultural heritage specialist, they may not understand why, and this is where the BIM system comes in. You can add a constraint of flag, going, oh, I want to do this with the building, look at the BIM data set, go, actually no, I need to speak to this person before I do anything. So it's adding some kind of future-proof system to the buildings that you want to kind of study and, and to act. It should be meant more for non-specialists. It's all well and good that we kind of produce something and say, yep, yeah, we'll do this. But if someone comes in and doesn't understand it at all, then having a system, a cultural heritage-specific BIM, is something that's very, very helpful. And it allows for an interaction. Within that, you have something called a KB system, which is the database attached to it, which, to which contains all your metadata. With the survey data that we've got from Kazan Church, it's quite important, I think, more to focus on the KB system. If you have, um, so I said at the bottom, visualization not as important. You have laser scan data, you have photogrammetry, you have panoramic photos. You don't need to focus too much then on the CAD visualization because you can integrate that into it. If you have a BIMS data set where you go, well, this data, so your point cloud, it's online, a video, use that and integrate it into it. It's much better than reproducing the whole thing. 
Uh, there's a system that people create, it's called a BIM ready data set, which isn't BIM ready at all. They just kind of said, yeah, I've done the CAD drawing, why not take, the, take this and try and do something with it? And it's changing the whole idea of it. And the KBIS system, again, is, is more reliable uh, and it's going to be a better system. Um, and this kind of matches up to what we're doing within Culture Heritage with kind of data management. It's, if you take individual section and you apply it to the KBIS system, it's much better. But like I said, when we were doing the CAD model, when we were doing this BIM model previously, we had to follow a set guideline given to us by the Estonian um, real estate company. So we've kind of gone through, we have this basic kind of CAD drawing which outlines all the building work and then what you can see on this side are all the individual layers that we have. So on the roof we have quite a few different systems uh, that gives you the material properties, it kind of gives you the volume calculations, uh, the age, everything associated with what you want to know about a building. And it's the ability to kind of select it and kind of go through is most important. And again, because of this, we had to produce these CAD models. Um, so it, we've, as you can see, when you compare it to the laser scan data, it's a very simplified version. But as I said, the visualization is not as important because you can kind of go back and, and reuse it. So as we go through, you can see that the CAD drawings are, are quite high resolution, or quite high detailed, but it's this ability then to outline different things. So this, the internal property, well, this was, the internal properties mixed with the exterior guttering and then everything associated with the roofing. And that's quite a nice little feature. But the ability once you've separated and segregated it is then the separation of each individual section. And this is where the BIM comes in. If you want to look at the specific areas of interest, you don't have to take all your data. You can have something in a very simple format such as this, please work. Oh, it didn't work. <laughs> so close. Never mind. You can go in the folder and then you, you can restart the, the video. I've crashed it. Okay. I'll show you later on. <laughs> Basically, it's a 3D PDF that has the entire BIM data set within it. You can, can then go through a user cab model and then it has everything so you can pre-select it. And that's quite a nice system of sharing it. Rather than share the entire model, why not share just a 3D PDF because it's a lot simpler way of sharing it. And again, that's the important thing with that is data. Within the whole system, we have laser scanning, we've geo-referenced everything, the point cloud model we have, photogrammetry model, author photos, done a point cloud video, CAD models, we've done the BIM, We've done the plans and we have a web panoramic system that we've set up as well. That combined is a fantastic data set from which to use. If you then look at other surveys that are completed by other companies or other individuals, but they generally don't have all this data set. So you're limiting yourself as to what you can do. So that collaboration in terms of what you produce with BIM needs to be based on your original survey data. If your survey data is poor and it's done not to kind of the guidelines that exist, then your kind of data set that you get out of it is not going to be the greatest. Factors within that, so I'm not going to read it out, well maybe I will, but the most important thing with that is in, is in the project planning and looking at what data currently exists and what you can use within it. There are whole building surveys that are archived, I know this from the UK, the archive everything that you do and then you can access it through web portals or through different kind of heritage bodies. And it's already kind of getting that, and we've kind of done this with like the dendrochronology. We've attached that to the BIM data set that we have, and it's been a lot easier in terms of understanding specific sections related to cultural heritage. But you need to relook at the standards and resources, the reuse and repurposing, the integrity of the application, and the rights and obligations as to what you can do with it. We're limited in terms of what we can publicly share with the BIM because it's managed and owned by the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, so there's only so much in terms of what we can really show. But in terms of the future of BIM, the whole idea of creating set level two and level three procedures is something that should be completely changed. You should produce something and then from that, whether you then choose whether or not you should have a set level. Your initial design model uh, from which structural architectural service changes or additions to structures can be developed is important, but it needs to support ongoing maintenance of the structures because that's the whole purpose when moving forward with BIM, it's what we can do with it in the future. There's no point looking at, well, this has been done in the past. You want to see, say, 10 years, 20 years' time, what can be done? Say the thatch roof, for example. Every 10 years, the thatch roof needs to be changed. If that's integrated into the BIM data set, that adds a system that kind of manages the building slightly more. You want to integrate more survey data, 
I want to add in the 4D or 5D ability within BIM, such as the phasing method to show some form of time changes, but the whole system is very much confined by software choices. So at the minute, it's still early days of what BIM can really add to culture heritage, but it's moving in the right direction. If there's a more streamlined guideline that's set up and more integration of it, then it's going to be a better. So it, again, this is just a, a kind of a brief example as to what BIM can be. But maybe in say like a couple of years' time, when more systems exist, then I can come back and maybe talk about how this has actually been. These kind of comments are made. Have they been implemented? And that's something that should be done. But thank you very much.